that will accomplish that which you set it forth to do, Lord. I thank you that I'm merely a vessel and I'm very well aware of that. A vessel that you desire to use this day to minister to your people. And so I say in Jesus' name and believe and receive that none of my words will fall to the ground, but they will enter into the spirits of these precious ones that are seated here in different parts of the church building and via social media. I thank you that your word has power and there's no distance between us and you, Father. You're as close, Jesus, as the mention of your name. And I thank you now, Father, that your word is already anointed. I ask you to anoint this servant in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, this morning, beloved, we're continuing on our message, the power of forgiveness. As I said last time, forgiveness is the act it is the act of love. It's, it's everything. When we forgive, we are walking in what we believe. It's not just words, it's action. Forgiveness is love in action. You are doing what you believe the Word of God's telling you to do. You believe that you have to do something that might be uncomfortable for you to your flesh, probably is, most of the time. But when you do it, you feel so liberated because it is the act of love. That's why Jesus could say what he said in the tree. Forgive them. Forgive them, Lord. What was he saying? Forgive them as I forgive them, Father because they know not what they do. Well, you may be here today and you may be saying, well, uh, got some people I gotta forgive, but they did know what they did, what they knew. Well, that's between them and God then, isn't it? That's not for you to worry about. That's just for you to get over and say, God, I'm turning it over to you. Yeah. Amen? I'll do that over here too. <laughs> I'm just giving it to you. It's so, I tell you, it's so liberating. It's so liberating when you can do what I've just said. Hallelujah. Forgiving those, beloved, who have wronged us is a tough commandment to follow. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and I'll read for a few moments from the Amplified Version of the Bible, starting with verse 4. Love endures long and is patient. Another word, if I believe it's the King James. There's another version anyway that says it's long suffering. In other words, it suffers long. <laughs> we don't do it overnight. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited. Love is not arrogant and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerable, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, now let's read this carefully. Love, God's love in us. You've heard this taught, the agape love, not the filio love, the agape love inside of us does not insist on its own rights and its own ways, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. This is a big one, beloved. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. That's hard for our flesh. Can anybody say amen? Come on, are you here? It's the truth. This is not easy. But God wouldn't tell us to do it if he didn't equip us to do it. This is what we must understand. 
It does not rejoice. Love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. And verse seven, love bears up under anything and everything that comes. This love I'm talking about here, beloved, is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Ever ready. It's hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. And this love endures everything without weakening. And that's why these next three words are in your Bible. Love never fails. We can fail. People around us can fail. Our very closest friends can fail you. Our workmates can fail you. People that you would never believe could ever fail you can fail you. But love never fails. And when you understand the power of forgiveness, you will walk in a different level with God. And I need to, to preface this by saying, have I arrived? No, absolutely not. As long as I'm in this frail body, this body that's going to go into the, the, to dust someday, as long as I'm breathing, I will fail at times to walk what I'm teaching. But it's, the key to it is to get before God immediately or as quick as you possibly can and say, Father, forgive me. Hello? Forgive me. I missed it. I missed it royally. I missed it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And you know what? It's over. It's you and I that prolong and prolong and prolong. And we keep going back to the altar with the same thing over and over again. Sometimes I wonder if God just someday will just open up the heavens and say to all of us, have you, you had enough yet? I'm tired listening to you. You know, I've heard it and I've heard it and I've heard it. I've already forgiven you, forgiven you, forgiven you. Will you just give it a bye and go on? Sometimes we just need to see the practical side of it. Because the Bible says that God sits up in the heavens and laughs. I know he laughs at me every day. There's something I might have pulled, you know, out of the hat. We're human. Let's stop beating ourselves up. And I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of it. You see, when I was first taught this, what I'm teaching you, the, the, one of the main things that came out of me that God gave me was to, and it's always been with me since way back, and that is that statement that love will, how do I put this, Father? Will all, always think the best of every person. That's hurt me many times. But I refuse to stay in Hurtsville. Just because somebody, I believe the best of this person or that person and they let me down or, or whatever, that's not going to stop me believing the best in the next person that's coming in or the next person coming into my life, personal life, the next relationship, the next friendship. I refuse to walk through life wondering who's going to get me next. Do you hear what I'm saying? I won't live that way. I don't believe any Christian should ever live that way. The Bible's very clear. It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. And that's why there's so much weakness in the body. Not I'm talking about just fair hymns. I'm talking about all many, many churches right now are going through difficult, difficult times. But it's that joy that will bring you forth. It's that joy that will give you your strength. And that's where the enemy attacks us. He doesn't want us to be happy. He doesn't want us to, to have a testimony. He doesn't want us to be above the free. He wants to drown us. It's you and I every day that makes a decision as to how we're gonna live for that day. And yes, you might fail. Yes, you might fall. Yes, you might do a lot of things, but just remember, His grace is sufficient for you. Isn't that what you said this morning, Paul? Yeah. Thank you, Father. Just quickened it to me. 
His grace is sufficient for you. His grace will always be there for you. And that grace that he gave to you, the church, is the same grace he expects you to give to others in need. That grace. But talking about the power of forgiveness today, forgiving those who have wronged us, as I said a few moments ago, it's not an easy command to follow. It's very, very hard. Our human nature finds it easier and much more satisfying, beloved, to hold on to our anger and to feel sorry for ourselves and have our pity party candles blowing out. Okay? I mean, we've got to come to the place where we say, God, I am your child and I am going to walk the way you've taught me to walk. And I am going to choose this day to put my flesh under. Just hang it up. I'm going to walk the love walk. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to do what my spirit man wants done and not my flesh. So as vessels of God's love, Christians no longer live accordingly. Listen to this. They don't live according to the impulses of the flesh. Thanks to the Holy Spirit. When someone mistreats you, we can only forgive. We can't not just forgive, but we can also show love to that person. And this is your choice. We can still love. It may be from a distance, but it doesn't take the love out of your heart. This, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord, this is Christianity 101. This is what this is all about. The night that I got saved, I knew something radically had changed in my life. And I heard a song years ago by the Scottish Camerons and I cried for days and days and days because it was an invitation to go to the throne of grace daily and talk to God. And it was in the form of a song. Give me a heart for others, a longing to bring souls to thee. Give me the privilege to tell them of your love on Calvary's tree. Into the highways and byways, I'll be what you want me to be. Give me a heart for others that I might win them for thee. That's the gospel. And when you pray that prayer, something happens inside of you. That's why I get back to believing the best of every person. Because that's what Jesus does. That's what he did on Calvary's tree for you. Because he loved you. And he believed the best of you. And he was giving his church a reputation to live up to. And it's called three words. Love never fails. Never. Yes, the phileo selfish love will, but not the agape. The agape love is supernatural love. It's godly love. It comes from Father's heart. The love of God has been, the love of God, not the love of humanity. The love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost. And it's that love that will keep you unto that day. It's that love that will strengthen you. It's that love that will see you through every tragic event of your life. It's the love. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us several important aspects of this love. First, love does not seek its own. Many people are preoccupied with their rights. Yet, The idea of entitlement is a worldly creation, not a biblical mandate. 
This doesn't mean that we allow others, beloved, to take advantage of us. Rather, our primary concern should not be with our interests. Instead, we're to be focused on showing God's love to our enemy. Whoa, that's not easy. If you have an enemy, I pray I don't have an enemy. I don't feel that way about anyone. I don't know who out there may think I am, but I don't have an enemy. Which, this is the mandate from Scripture found in Matthew 5.44. This is the power of forgiveness. The second, things, the first, second thing that 1 Corinthians tells us about is love is not provoked. Maintaining a peaceful spirit when you're irritated, it's very difficult. And I can speak from my own Scottish heritage, okay? Uh, And and I'm not blaming that because I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Old things have passed away and all have become new. I have to work at that scripture like everybody else. But sometimes if I get rubbed the wrong way, I don't think I act. And that's just the Scots in me. Not darn meddle with me. (laughs) Don't dare mess with me. That's the McKinnon clan. Okay, and, and it's just in me, you know, I get angry. And sometimes it can be a righteous anger, and it's okay. Other times it's not a righteous anger. Because I know the difference, when it's not a righteous anger, I want to do something physically. <laughs> I, know I, I know I'm preaching to the right church. I know I am. I sometimes wonder, but... In this instance, I know you all know what I'm talking about. So don't look at me with that holy look. (laughs) Praise God. Hallelujah. So we see that Jesus had to face so many things. One of the big things was the religious leaders who deliberately, they deliberately provoked him. Yet on the cross, He sought the Father's forgiveness for them too. They were included in this world. And finally, in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it teaches us that love does not take into account a wrong suffered. God's love flows through us. And with that love that's flowing through us, it it can remove the hurts done by someone else, but we must let this happen instead of holding on to painful memories. It, they, you can't erase the past. It's gone, it's over. It's all spilt milk, it's all water under the bridge. And we would say in Christianity, it's all under the blood. You can't live on yesterday's manna. You can't live in yesterday's bitterness and strife and all of these things that are demonic. God's ways are peace. God's ways are pleasantness. And you might not always feel peace and you might not always feel pleasant. And that's okay as long as before you go to sleep at night, you get it right. I sometimes wonder, I'm telling you, you know, the, I just don't even get away with chewing gum. The Holy Spirit convicts me all day long of something. I'm not saying chewing gum's wrong, okay? Oh, Pastor Pat, I can't chew gum anymore. I'm not saying that. We're just making a statement. The little things I can't get away with. And I can't, sometimes I can't fathom how Christianity works without that kind of conviction from God, but yet I know it's not in every Christian's life. Because if it was in our Christian, if it was in 24-7 way of walking and talking and not just talking about it, but walking the walk, the church, and I'm talking about the church, would be walking in a lot more power than we're walking in. But that power comes from anointing. An anointing is only present where there is pureness. The pureness of God delivers the anointing of God. Oh, hallelujah. It's another teaching that I don't have time to get into all of this right now, but bear with me. Jesus himself 
thought, uh, or sought forgiveness for every human being. Yes, people will wrong you, but we have an unprovoked caring attitude. We have to get, get it into our minds that no matter what happens to you in this world, Jesus said he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. So if everybody jumps ship in your life, there's one that's holding on and you're holding on to his nail-scarred hand. He's not moved by anything. He knows the beginning from the end of our lives. He knows the beginning from the end of this world. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows how many years this world's gonna exist. He knows who the presidents are gonna be, who the kings are gonna be, who the queens are gonna be. He knows who your children's gonna be, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and generations to come should the Lord tarry. There's nothing God doesn't know. But we put him in this little box. No, he said, get me out of there. I'm going to do things you haven't even thought about yet. But it's his timing. God can give us vision and I have a vision. But I know what's as important, lined up as a vision, is God's timing. God's timing is perfect. And God knows exactly what he is doing in our lives. Just like he knew in Peter's life. We've, we've told the story, but let me just refresh your memory. The story starts with the apostle Peter and he comes to Jesus with a question that we've all asked. We can laugh at Peter all we like, but at least Peter got out of the boat and he was real, thank you. Wherever that was, you can come up here and finish this message. I'm teasing. <laughs> he comes to Jesus with a question that we've all asked. We've all asked it at one time or another. Somebody had done him wrong and he had forgiven him. The same fellow had done it again and Peter had forgiven him. He did it again and Peter had forgiven him and it goes on and on again and again. But this time, Peter got mad. Hello. He had enough. So he comes to Jesus with a question. And I'm sure those disciples were all sitting there saying, I'm so glad he asked. I wanted to ask too. Yeah, I love, I love Peter. He's the one that went there. Yeah, God bless Peter. God bless his heart. Because they were all waiting for the same answer because they were going through the same difficulties in life. Are you? Of course we are. Might be different levels, but believe me, if you live long enough, you'll understand this teaching is real. Hallelujah. So he comes to Jesus. How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter wanted to know how much more do you want me to have to take here? What happened? He wanted to know, when do you quit turning the other cheek? Everyone has felt this way before, or at least most people, if you're old enough. You take it and you take it and you take it. And that, then you take it again and you keep taking it. And then you say, if he does it one more time, or if she does it one more time, I'm going to punch them. Well, when you hear a pastor say something like that, well, oh, that's not very Christian. Really? Really? There is such a thing as tough love. I don't mean that means you punch somebody, but what I am saying is that sometimes you have to correct. Sometimes you, there's tough love involved. Not because for you, the person that's giving that tough love, but to help the person you're giving it to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it takes you and I to say, Lord, show me how to do this. 
So Peter, <laughs> Peter wanted to know how long he had to wait before he literally blew his stack, let's face it. Peter didn't wait for an answer. That was his nature. Peter was wired to go ahead of him, his own body, all the time. And so he already had, he already knew, he's, he, asked, he answered his own question. He had it ready. Don't you love this guy? He's one of the first I want to see when I get to heaven. <laughs> And I'm going to tell him, I say, Peter, I related to you in so many things. I open my mouth so big so many times and I put my foot in it. And I, because I can relate to Peter. I really can. And I know many of you can. Maybe not to the degree I can, but we're all on different levels here. So Peter didn't wait for an answer. He said to Jesus seven times. Now, you, you have to understand what he was thinking. Our temptation is to get down on him for saying that, but it wasn't such a bad idea. You see, the rabbis taught that you had to forgive a man three times and then you could retaliate. <laughs> so Peter thinks to himself, well, I'll just double that and add one. Because after all, seven times is the perfect number. I'll get away with that. We laugh. But isn't that how we think, beloved? You see, if you want to live your life with the power of forgiveness and a good attitude, there will come a time when you have to choose. And you can write this down because God gave me this a long time ago. You'll have to choose between turning the page or closing the book. To be perfectly honest, forgiving a man seven times is commendable for Peter and everyone else. Most of us get frustrated if we have to forgive somebody twice. By human standards, what Peter said was enormous in his day. Forgiving a man seven times, Peter didn't mean to offend. He thought by saying seven times, he would be extravagant. And everybody would look at him and say, wow, where did that come from, Peter? Boy, you had, you had some good things there. Wow, I would never have said that. But do you, do you believe he said seven times? I can just see this scene. In truth, in truth, his heart was pure. His heart was pure, but his attitude was wrong. He wanted to put a legal limit on forgiveness. He wanted a number, a limit, a place where he could finally say no more. I've got a newsflash for the church, beloved. As long as you're in this physical body, there will never be a time called no more. But by the grace of God, there will always be a time when you can shine. There'll always be a time when you can say, I will arise and shine and I will let my light shine before men that they might see my good works and glorify my Father. There will come a time when you can say, no, instead of saying no more, you can say, okay, God, just keep moving in my life to mature me into the likeness of Jesus Christ. <laughs> amen and amen. Oh, hallelujah. So Jesus answered him, I tell you, Peter, not seven times seven, but 70 times seven. Now, did you just hear that thump? That was Peter passing out, okay? <laughs> he dropped over unconscious. He couldn't believe his ears. 70 times 70. He's already doing all the arithmetic. <laughs> That's 490 times. Jesus is saying, Peter, you've got this all wrong. 
You don't count the number of times you forgive someone. Forgiveness is unlimited. If you don't hear another thing I say today, beloved, get those three words. Forgiveness is unlimited for the Christian. The world, no. The Christian, yes. Yes, beloved. It's not that you say to yourself, 299, 300, only 109, 190 more to go. No, 70 times seven means there is no limit to the number of times I should forgive someone else. By the time you've forgiven somebody 490 times, you've got into the habit of continuing to forgive. You got the message. And it comes very simple after a while. It really does. I've been in situations in my life when people have said to me, you know, please forgive me. And I can honestly say, I forgave you before you even told me. That's the gospel. I don't want to sound like I'm putting myself up on some pedestal. Please knock me off of there fast. I'm telling you truth. I've gotten to that place of years and years of experience in life living in three different countries, starting a ministry. I mean, I've had a very, very um, different, exciting life. It's something that I never ever planned would ever be my life. But through that journey have been tragic situations, situations that I would rather not talk about. But people get into the, you know, when they hear a pastor, it's kind of like, well, it's good for you to say these things, but have you really, really thought about forgiveness? Have you really had to, in your personal life, had to really forgive? Oh, yes, I have. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Okay, then I'll, I'll tell the story. <laughs> When I was a young girl, I was about, I was probably 12 or 13, somewhere in there. I had a school teacher. She was called Miss Boland. I still remember her to this day. For whatever reason, she did not like me. And I'm not making any excuses here. She just didn't like me. And my two best subjects in school were uh, arithmetic and spe uh, spelling. And she would stand at her desk and she would point to the students in the room. And she would she'd put you in the spot, she'd say five eights. I knew these are us, I knew them. But when she pointed to me, I froze. I knew how to spell most of the words that she would point to me. I was never the top of my class, but that was the two things that, that I excelled in. And when she would point her finger to me, I just froze. This is a story in forgiveness I hope you'll never forget. That's why I'm bringing it up here. Yeah. I don't enjoy having to say these things. But it's for you, not me. Now, in those days, I mean, today in our society, we would call it child abuse. But in those days, we, we would get the belt. It was a long leather belt with what they called tongues on the end of it. And you, that would be a single, and that would be a double. And when you missed whatever this teacher was saying, that was the time, if you missed it so many times, she would bring you up in the belt. And I would, I mean, I had, I had the belt, these, in this time of my life was a very difficult time. My parents knew nothing about it because we were taught in a society that, you know, the teacher was right, you obey your elders, and I'm not saying anything's wrong with that, but to a degree where we were taught there was plenty wrong with it. One of the things that I, was, I grew up with, a child should be seen and not heard. I don't believe that anymore. But at one time I did. And my mom and my dad, they would feel that if the teacher had to, you know, if you were home and said, I got the belt today, you'd have got the belt again. You know, not maybe by my father, but that was the times I lived in. Please hear me. And so, but that's how that generation thought. 
Well, if you were bad in the school, you're going to get it again here. You're supposed to obey your teacher, whether the teacher was right. So I said nothing. And one day she, she said, I don't, you're not getting a single, you're getting a double. And I remember I put my hands out of that and I was shaking like that. I was, I, I just didn't know what, I was numb. And so I went, just as she took the belt up, I went like that. And she hit herself. Well, I, I tell you, you know what King David said, if I had wings to fly, I would have flown away. I stood there, I was petrified. And from that moment on, my life became hell. I never told my parents. I woke up every night crying. I had nightmares. I could see this belt coming down. And without going into all the details, my mum and dad finally figured out something's wrong with Pat. What is wrong with her? I, I never wanted to go to school, and I loved school. I never wanted to go out. I wanted to just stay home. I, it was terrible, terrible period of my life. So they figured out something, and finally, without me getting into all the details, my father took care of the situation. And I was never called out again in that classroom. I'll leave it at that. Now, years later, fast forward to my salvation. Fast forward to the teaching on love. Fast forward to the teaching on forgiveness. And I would be in prayer and it would be like a blank. It would be like I was hitting. When I would talk about forgiveness or think about forgiveness or write my notes down, it was like I was hitting a wall. And the, finally, the Lord spoke to me. I'll never, because I had been years, yes, even, even into, into my young married life after my children. I mean, I was busy and we worked and all these other things, but that was still there. I can still remember going to bed at night and thinking about these things. And I never really felt that I held on to something with Miss Boland, but I knew after this experience I did. And so one day the Holy Ghost finally got through to me. He said, you have to forgive her. And I said, God, what? He said, you know, I taught you last week about the tormentors. Yeah. Well, come, I was tormented. I could go for maybe a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden I would go into this place where I would be thinking about her all the time. Reliving what should have been gone years before. Well, that day I got before God, beloved, and I cried out to God and I asked him, forgive me, Father, for holding this against her. I didn't know what I was doing. I, don't even knew, I didn't even know at that time if she was still dead or if she was alive or dead, and that's the truth. I said, I forgive her. I forgive her with everything in me. My life changed after that experience. After I experienced that, I never had a dream again. I never, and I mean, when I bring it up to it like now, it's like, did that really happen? See, that's what, that's what happens when you truly forgive. When you truly forgive, you, you'll find as the time goes on, it's a, it it's just, just disappears. It's like it was never there. So when I stand here or any other pastor stands here and they give you a life experience like I've just did, it's to tell you you're not alone. We're not in some place that we, we're... We're immune to this. No. This is my gift. I have a gift to be practical, to tell stories, to give you life experiences. That's my lane of traffic. Does that mean that a teacher and a teacher's teacher and all these other people are wrong? No. They have a different gift. And I tried to go into different gifts when I was younger. I fell flat in my face because I wasn't called to that. So when you hear these stories and you hear these life experiences, I'll guarantee you one thing. I will hear from people via 
uh, social media that I don't even know. And they will talk about this, what I just said, because it makes the power of forgiveness real. They will say how much that helped them because so many people, beloved, are holding on to so many things and we've got to let it go. Do you want to be like Jesus? This is what we're talking about. I had a lot more notes, but I just want to close up with one thing here. I believe this will help you. There was a group of women in a Bible study. In the book of, they were studying the book of Malachi. As they were studying the cha a cha chapter three, they came across verses three, which say, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. This verse puzzled the women and they wondered what this statement meant about the character and nature of God. One of the women offered to first to find out about the process of the refining silver and get back to the group at their next Bible study. That week, this woman called up a, sil a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work. She didn't mention anything about uh, the reason for her interest, the reason for her interest, of course, in silver, beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. As she watched, the silversmith held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest as to burn away all, we would say in Scotland, all the dross, all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse that he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered, absolutely yes. He not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eye on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left even for a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment. Then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully ref refined? He smiled at her and answered, Please never forget this, beloved. Oh, that's easy. It's when I see my image in it. That's the power of forgiveness. Every time you forgive, you get closer and closer to the way Jesus lives. You get closer and closer to the master. And people will start to see Jesus. In you. You see, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's really just that simple. So you might say, well, how does this happen for me? How does this happen for me? It happens through the power of forgiveness. So we may think that we're going through things that where are you, God? God's right there, holding you as precious silver. 
every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would, please. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word will not return void. Your word will accomplish that which you set it forth to accomplish. I ask for every person within the sound of my voice to soul search today. As we heard earlier in this service, just you and him or you and her. Just to talk to Jesus. Because at the end of the day, beloved, that's what it's all about. Standing before him, your master, and hearing well done. That's what it's all about. So I want to take a moment just for you to talk to Jesus. you've got out against any put it on the altar once and for all and sometimes if the truth be known the hardest person to forgive is yourself put that on the altar too because God forgave you a long time ago when he sent Jesus you do not know him today, he's as close as the mention of his name. Ask him to come into your life, to forgive you of your sins, and he will sup with you. He will open the door. Before I finish with the blessing, I want to remind you of Wednesday evening prayer right here at church. We'll be praying ahead of time for the National Day of Prayer on Thursday night. And also for some needs that I believe will be met Wednesday night. The Lord has blessed you. The Lord has kept you. The Lord has made his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord has made his face to shine upon you and give you peace. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Beloved, go with Jesus. You can go with him knowing he's right there with you. Give somebody a holy elbow.